Uh, in terms of feasibility, I think the 1.5 limit will be extremely difficult. And the, the main problem, I don't think, is going to be the matter of the availability of technology. I think the deeper issue is really the economic, social, and political complexity of essentially transforming not only the global economy, but in, to large measure the way people, particularly in developed countries, live and the way developing countries may develop in the future. We know rather less about the social and political aspect of these things from an analytic point of view. We spend a lot of time trying to delve into future technologies, but the technologies probably will come along. It's how and if and whether we utilize them appropriately. I think clearly it's going to be challenging to meet 1.5 or even two degree limit. Um, it will require global transformations across all sectors of the economy. Uh, I think. You know, the feasibility has got to be judged against the other side as well. So if we if we don't meet the targets, you know, what are the impacts? And we, we know that as temperatures rise, the impacts get worse and the damages increase. So I think it's, you know, we have to do this and we have to cut emissions straight away. We actually, from the scientific study and our uh, regional modeling study, we found that it is, uh, we are going to cross uh, the way the emission is by 2025. Uh, and uh, most likely, uh, most at most by 2030. But uh, this is uh, 10 to 15 years from now, we are crossing 1.5 degree the way the world is going. But the question is, if we have adapted it is very seriously, maybe we will reach there, but it's not a fixed level. We may be come down to a more sustainable pre-industrial level even. So it is possible to attend that if we are able to work now. And this kind of conference here in Oxford is giving a very good uh, scientific feedback also, as well as policy feedback to the uh, policy makers and national leaders to come with the uh, solutions, how we can reach the Paris Agreement uh, efforts to uh, limit the uh, emission to 1.5 degree centigrade from the pre-industrial period. So I think it is feasible, but it's a very uh, uh, important effort from all kinds of stakeholders, like the scientists, natural scientists, the economists, and uh, uh, planners, policy makers, to come together to put a great deal of effort to limit the emissions uh, from now. I think as we stand here today, and particularly in the context of this conference, it's quite clear that in terms of a business as usual pathway, it will not be feasible. But this is also the great challenge for the scientific community, policy makers, for every actor in our society. It is a transformation that we will literally have to engineer, we will have to catalyze, and we will have to have the support of not just leaders or captains in industry, but people. But I think looking forward, first of all, there is no alternative to trying to move towards a 1.5 degree target. And I think in the history of humanity, we've all often seen the ability to reinvent ourselves. And I think this is one of those moments. So in principle, I remain convinced that that is an extremely challenging target. But I think no one at least has the evidence right now to say it is impossible. Well, it's clearly very feasible. There's lots of ways you could do it. The, the issue, though, is that it's a colossal challenge in almost every sector of society. Um, and hearing the, the talk today, um, I think the most important thing to get across is that it's an urgent challenge that people need to address now rather than debate whether or not it is feasible. We've got to go all out for it because so many people's lives depend upon it. Well, it's geophysically feasible in that we are now at about one degree, um, so we've got half a degree to go, uh, which means that we would have to reduce emissions by 20% for every tenth of a degree of warming on average from now on. Now, if you think about that, a tenth of a degree at the moment is only taking about seven or eight years. So that immediately makes you think, okay, it's geophysically feasible, but how technically feasible or even more so politically feasible it is remains open to question. But one of the key messages of Paris was that the politicians don't want the scientific community to tell them what's politically feasible. They want to make the decisions. They want us just to explore what the implications are of the different options they have. So, I mean, first of all, how how how, necessary, no, how much do we need the 1.5 degree goal? And I work in the polar regions, and it's quite clear that many processes in the polar regions are very very susceptible to just um, small temperature increase. And then those changes in the polar regions have a global impact as well. So whether we're talking about um, uh, the impact of 
changes on, on the ice sheets in Greenland or in, or in West Antarctica, we're already um, potentially seeing indications of some of the ice sheets, uh, some of the key glaciers in, in West Antarctica potentially being in a reversible retreat just with the temperature rise that we're already seeing. So you know, there's an indication, there are others as well, um, that e even more distemperature temperature rise is, is a cause of significant concern. How feasible is it to address the 1.5 degree challenge? I mean, that's really not my research area at all, but I do do a lot of work with the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, where we work with um, a broad range of different businesses. And the one thing that I've really gained insight from that is that there's huge amounts of sort of enthusiasm, creativity, people get inspired and you know, want to innovate when they're set a challenge in the business community. I kind of have this sense that you know, if the right challenge was set and enough people in the business community really inspired to get behind it, I kind of feel that you know, whether we get enough action to get fast enough to get um, to, to 1.5, no, I don't know, but I do sense that a lot could be done on quite rapid timescales if people really focused in on it. And I think, you know, as I say, I think there is that inherent enthusiasm, desire, creativity. You see repeated stories of co companies I interact with, whereby when they set these sort of ambitious goals for doing something on sustainability, they say that their whole workforce gets inspired to, to get behind it. And it comes with actually all sorts of interesting co-benefits internally just for, for the organizations themselves. So Maybe there's some hope. <laughs> okay, that's a very good question. I think the 1.5 degree limit, I think there's a bit of a mm, misconception at first. A lot of people think we are already almost got to one and a half degrees or we're going past it. But in, f in fact, we're still quite a long way off one and a half degrees, both in terms of temperature, we've only just gone past one degree and we're already quite far away in terms of the carbon budget and I do think because of that misconception about how far away we are from the target there has been too much emphasis on quite extreme and radical interventions to try and get there in terms of really talking about mm, negative emission technologies and about geoengineering in terms of solar radiation management and there's been too much emphasis on these extreme interventions and not enough emphasis on what society can really do to begin to go down these strong mm, mitigation pathways in terms of changing our energy sector really markedly, changing our transport sector really markedly, and changing the way we heat our spaces. So I think talking about how we implement these mitigation and pathways is a far more constructive debate. I'm very upset that we're not seeing at all at this conference.